So hi everyone, uh, so my name is Mike Brudno and I'll be doing the first module of this course uh, and giving you a little bit of a general introduction to genetic disorders and what it goes into collecting the data about the patient and <coughs> then looking into how to that data is, then gets analyzed in the context of the genome, which you will hear a lot about in uh, all of the other modules on the course as well. So just as an overview, I'll give a very brief overview of genetic diseases. And here I'm going to be talking about germline diseases, not uh, cancers. They're sort of somewhat different beast. And um, talk about phenotyping, what goes into actually describing patient features. Identification of candidate variants, what goes into identifying which of the variants in somebody's exome or genome actually causes their disease. And talk about something called matchmaking to establish which variant actually is causative. So sometimes you know, and sometimes you actually need to have a little dating game uh, between patients with rare diseases, and we'll actually do that as part of the lab. So very broadly talking about genetic variants. Uh, single nucleotide variants, indels, CNVs, um, they happen naturally in every single generation. Every single generation that's uh, born has some number of variants that weren't present in the previous one. Uh, for single nucleotide variants, it's, you know, ballpark 100, you know, give or take, depends a lot on the father's age. Um, most of these variants will do absolutely nothing. They're benign. They don't contribute to any disease, or they cause some small, or they don't have any phenotype whatsoever, or they cause small phenotypic differences, which we see, you know, about presence among the people in the room, you know, different hair color, different skin tones, you know, different heights, all of these things that, um, you know, we, we sort of understand as being completely normal. A small fraction of the variants will be disease-causing. And they will either cause a disease or cause a disease if you have two bad copies of a specific gene, so recessive diseases. Um, some of these will be under selection. So what does that mean? Well, that means that every next generation is less likely to have that variant than the previous one, meaning that people with that mutation don't have as high a chance of reproducing when it comes to the next generation. So most of the very severe rare diseases which cause, you know, severe intellectual deficits or physical feature, you know, <coughs> strong physical manifestations would lead to you know, less likelihood of, you know, having children. Other such variants don't really have to be under selection. They could actually be perfectly fine in the population. And this applies to pretty much any variant that's either triggered by drugs, so a pharmacogenomic variant, because unless you're getting a very specific drug and there is no counter effect, there's no real selection on that variant. Um, so uh, for example, there's a specific variant that leads to a very severe effect in combination with um, uh, uh, anesthesia. Now, until very recently, people didn't get anesthesia. So obviously that variant had absolutely no effect over in terms of selection. Similarly, diseases that really manifest themselves in old age, Alzheimer's disease, if there are variants that cause that, they're not going to be under selection. They're not going to really make a difference as to whether somebody can have children successful. Finally, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of variants will be advantageous. They will actually make you smarter, faster, better than the previous generation. And what happens with those is that they eventually take over everybody and everybody will have them because you're, you know, you're more fit, you know, and you procreate better. Uh, so uh, genetic diseases are largely caused by changes to the DNA. There's also an environmental factor, but we sort of sweep it under the rug because we don't fully understand it. Uh, not that we understand the genetics that well. And people often talk about two types of genetic diseases, rare and common. In reality, it's a continuum, right? You start with ultra, ultra, ultra rare, of which there are five people in the whole world that have it, to, you know, your garden variety common disease that has some genetic component, but also has a strong environmental component and has a huge component of we don't really know. 
So rare diseases are typically caused by highly penetrant rare mutations. So these are going to be a variant that's present in just the people who have that disease. If you have that variant, you will have that disease. Or if you have two of those variants, you will have that disease, depending on if it's recessive or dominant. Um, common, there are many sort of hypotheses. Um, so common disease, there's some people who say that, I mean, it's also probably a combination. There's whether it's caused by rare variants that have variable penetrance. So it's actually, there's a rare variant that contributes, but it doesn't always contribute. There could be other modifiers that don't cause the effect, or there is, uh, um, a, there is something environmental that actually triggers the disease. Or it could be caused by aggregation and epistasis of more common variants. So if you have some like three of these variants, it's okay, but once you get to five of those, you start getting a phenotype. And as a result, it's much, we can't really fully understand it because we look at people's <coughs> genomes, we look at them like, is this variant correlated with the disease? Yeah, yeah it's kind of correlated. If you have this variant, you have a 10% higher risk of the disease. Okay, well, what does that going to do for you? It takes you from a 4% risk of the disease to a 4.4% risk of the disease, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, harder to interpret that data. And so we don't, you know, there may be many variants that are jointly acting. And models that actually, that things that model this have been built for certain quantitative features. But uh, it's harder to do with a, sort of a disease that's either on or off. So what are quantitative features, quantitative phenotypes? Things like height, head circumference, blood pressure, IQ, sort of. Um, these are things that are often, if you look across the population, they're going to be Gaussian distributed or close to Gaussian distributed. So if we take everybody who's in this room, you know, just probably for sex, and drew a height, look at our heights, you will get something that looks like a relatively normal curve. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions and there are variations of this. And this is because the reason that everything goes to a Gaussian distribution is basically because of the central limit theorem. Uh, if you have lots of variants which cause small effect, then you, on average, will have half of those variants on and half off. So you'll be somewhere around the middle. If you have a few more on, you start shifting in one direction or in the other direction based on um, the variant. So. Things like height, we think there are hundreds of genes, hundreds of variants in your genome which contribute to that. Which also leads to the terms like mean parental height, which is actually something that people use when looking at genetic disorders. You compare somebody's height to their average height of their parents, and if the average height of their parents is way out of whack with what you get for a child, something is interesting is going on. So it's uh, because you never expect them to be, you know, again, adjusted for uh, generation, because every generation is a little bit taller. All right. So how do we uh, find uh, the causes of genetic disease? Um, first, common disease, because there it's sort of a bit less that we can do. The main F way that people do this is through genome-wide association studies and variants on genome-wide association studies. So in the scientific communities, GWAS has a little bit of a bad name because there's been a lot of results and none of them, and may, many of them don't validate when you go to a different population. So people often say, I'm doing X and it's not GWAS. But if you think about what the word genome-wide association study means, it's exactly what they're doing. They're just calling it a different name. Uh, but basically coming up with a better ways of doing statistical correlation between variants and the disease. You have a whole bunch of people with a disease, a whole bunch of people without. Let's see, is the variant more common in people with the disease than people without the disease? Obviously, lots of variants to look at. So if we have to look at every single one of them, we're going to have a lot of false positives. Uh, so what people do is they try to pre-filter variants to reduce the set that they actually have to look at. So for example, looking at variants with functional links. So they're already involved in the disease pathway somehow. So that gives you some additional um, information. Uh, people also try to 
aggregate variance. They uh, say, okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to care about which variant you have in this gene. Just, do you have a variant in this gene? Or how many variants do you have in this pathway? Just try to look for enrichment. Um, <coughs> one thing that's important to realize about all of these GWAS kind of analysis, they identify correlation and not causation. So there's this brilliant thing known as linkage disequilibrium, which says that you, when you inherit a SNP, you actually inherit a whole bunch of SNPs that are nearby, and they tend to group together. So just because you grabbed onto a variant and say, oh, this one is correlated with the disease, it could be that the actual causative variant is actually somewhere nearby, and we just you haven't looked there. You found the marker, but not the actual cause. OK, what about uh, rare diseases? We're looking here for a single or two variants responsible for a disease. And I will, in this case, ignore all of the recent literature saying that a good fraction of people with rare diseases have two, three, four rare diseases all at the same time. Um, and if, I'll be happy to discuss that offline with anybody who's interested, uh, why that is the case. Uh, so here we're looking to take the variants across the genome, and there are you know, ballpark you know, several million variants if you sequence your genome relative to a reference, and distill it to the one or two that cause the disease. So there is many we can throw out right away. If a variant is present in 30% of the population and you're looking for a disease that's present in 0.00001% of the population, the variant at 30% goes out the window. So that's filtering out for common variants. Uh, similarly, you know, you can filter out variants based on the fact that they are in an intragenic region, and we, even if it causes the disease, we really don't understand it. So you'll never be able to explain how that variant causes the disease, and there are lots of variants like that that you can just throw out. Um, but at the end of the day, we need some ways to, you know, drill down to the exact variant. Um, the way that this has been done for the past 30-odd years, up until sort of seven or eight years ago, is through linkage. You find a family that has this, a lot of this disease, and then you start mapping. Which part of the genome do all of the people with the disease have in common, and all of the people without the disease have different? And there are pedigrees that have hundreds of individuals in them with a specific disease running through it, and they search down to try to figure out what portion to cut down the area. And this is how we mapped lots of the genetic diseases up until 10 years ago, uh, when we were able to sort of sequence whole genomes cheaply. For now, it was just, you know, find the family, find the region of interest, sequence that small region of interest, and look at what variants are there. This helps you identify actually the causative variant, because you're actually going down to the exact variant that's in the, that's causing the disease. So, this is the way things um, worked in the past, and a lot of what we're going to do today is saying how things work today for identifying variants that cause uh, a disease. So, one of the, however, you know, when uh, we talk about identification of a variant that causes a disease, one of the things that's really important to realize is that it, you need to know what disease. And it kind of sounds obvious, but actually it's a huge paradigm shift in the way genetic labs work. Genetic labs are, clinical genetic labs who are doing genetic testing, used to be it's like, please sequence this gene for me and tell me if there is a variant there. Well, this is because the clinician already knew that the phenotype fit this gene, and they didn't really need to tell the lab what the patient presented with because their order was the phenotype. It's like, I'm only interested in this one gene, so tell me if there's anything interesting there that could cause the disease that's explained by this gene. With whole exome or whole genome testing, everyone here knows what an exome is, I assume. Uh, it's basically a slice of the genome that's easily, more easily interpreted from a clinical perspective. Uh, the, uh, the test is, Look at this whole genome and tell me if you find anything interesting there. Well, 
you'll find something interesting there. But w can you tell me more of what you had in mind? Like, w what interesting things are you looking for? Are we looking for something that causes a heart defect or something that causes bone deformities? Those are very different genes. So for this, actually, we need the lab needs to understand what is the phenotype of the patient. What does the patient present with? And this has been a huge change in how genetic labs operate with the introduction of the exome or the genome. Because, you know, as I said before, it's like, please do the epilepsy panel for me. Well, that means the patient has epilepsy. You don't need to sort of go into much more detail. So you may think that we can just go into electronic health record and get this data. Well, a modern electronic health record actually sucks for collecting patient phenotype data. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, the primary, uh, primary ones, electronic health records, are exactly what they found like. They're made for recording things, not looking things up. So the idea is you put some information in, and then if you know exactly what you put in, where you put it in, then you can go in and find it. Sort of like this big broom closet in the slide. If you know, if you know exactly where you put the relevant piece of information, you can go in there and find it. But if it's somebody else who is looking for that piece of information, Good luck. Or if you've, it's been a while and you have uh, forgotten. Uh, the, there are other reasons why electronic health records don't work well, especially in the rare disease context, which I'll go into. But I mean, this is just a more philosophical slide. But what electronic health records should be doing is it should help guide the user around tests, genomes, and phenotypes. And it should be something that helps them in the interpretation process. And that's not something that's happening today to my knowledge at least. So when I talk about a patient phenotype, uh, I want to get the terminology a, a bit clearer. So I talk about um, deep phenotyping. And what's that is describing the features of an individual rather than of a disease. So uh, we don't want to just say they have diabetes. You want to talk about you know, whether they have obesity or not, whether they have uh, you know, uh, in, uh, their insulin levels. So breaking down the disease into the constitutive features. Because when you're working with a rare disease, often you're, you're just trying to establish what the diagnosis is. So if you actually know what the diagnosis is, you're, it's, 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 it's um, sort of, you, 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 this, this is not the right, uh, this, this is the right level that we need to be talking in, is the symptom level, not the disease name level. So when people used to do phenotyping, they did one of two things. They used either free text or check boxes. So with free text, the issue is that clinicians, when left to their own devices and uh, let loose on a keyboard, would come up with different ways to describe the exact same thing. A patient with dysmorphic features, so facial dysmorphisms, uh, some kind of non-standard facial structures, could be described in a note as DF, dysmorphic, dysmorphic faces, or dysmorphic features. They mean exactly the same thing, but uh, these are just synonyms. And DF is an acronym for it which obviously would require some context to interpret. These are actually all of the ways that the terms congenital malformation or congenital anomaly, which basically means something wrong at the time of birth, uh, showed up in lab notes at the hospital for sick children. And I just hear at least a couple of chuckles. Um, you know, there is anomaly, anomaly, you know, abnormalities, so people can't spell uh, or can't type. Which is fine. I mean, they're not, these are, you know, highly paid experts. They're not paid to type. Uh, there are abbreviations of different types and just different word choices. So these are, this makes the problem very difficult for computational approaches. You actually get lists like this, DD Kongma 4 behalf pro. Anybody want to venture guess what that is? Sorry? <laughs> Behavioral problems, <laughs> developmental delay, DD is developmental delay, or DD, DF, MR. <laughs> De developmental delay, uh, uh, dysmorphic features, and mental retardation. Of course, we're not really supposed to use the term mental retardation anymore. That sort of term is <laughs> now it's supposed to be intellectual deficit or intellectual disability. Uh, and even that, I think, is now going out of vogue and there's a new term for it. But you know, the issue is that these are things that are very hard even for humans to interpret and next to impossible for computers without a lot of context. The alternative is having checkboxes. Clinicians love these. 
the problem with checkboxes is you can't get sufficient granularity. So here there's a checkbox for language delay, but it doesn't say whether it's receptive language delay, speech delay, or both. Those are both types of language delay, but they actually could be indicative of different types of underlying problems. And similarly, you know, for cardiac, there is five uh, issues that are listed, but there's another box that sort of then you can go and go wild on again, and uh, it's uh, quite problematic. So lots of problems with how things work. Descriptions that make a lot of sense to a human are uninterpretable to a computer. Were things like first words at five years. That means a lot to a human. The child clearly has speech delay or, you know, or, uh, or speech delay, possibly a broader language delay. That's a phrase that a computer has no hope with any kind of AI that's available today of mapping down to the term speech delay. Because you need to have a lot of context. What does first words mean? The fact that this is an indication of speech at five years. Or actually, first words at five. Right? That phrase makes a lot of sense to you still. You don't need to know that it's five years and not five months. First words at five months would be very impressive. <laughs> uh, so uh, so it's, these are things that um, uh, you know, make, make, are easy for a human but difficult for a computer. Multiple terms with the same meaning, as I already discussed, and as a result, very difficult to do computation with phenotypes. So because of this, what we want to try to do is to map everything to ontologies. These are concepts that help you understand, assign conceptual meaning to specific words. So words, as we use them, have multiple meanings. So I'll take an example of uh, the word football. Um, and uh, what does that mean? Uh, when I say the word football, maybe you're thinking about this, uh, which is American football and uh, you know, quite popular. But uh, I'm actually from Europe, so I'm actually thinking about <coughs> that. So it's the exact same thing, but uh, it's called football in a different setting. And it's like, okay, well, we can guess, we can probably sort that out, but it gets worse. We could be talking about this. So for the visitors to this country, that's called Canadian football. It's sort of like American football, but the field's bigger and there are more players and the rules are a little bit different. Uh, but it's a close relative, but still different. Or this. Anybody know what this is? The Aussie Sorry? No, it's not Aussie. Aussie is the next one. Uh, Gaelic football. So this is played only in Ireland, but it's called football in Ireland. Um, so, and then there is Aussie football, uh, which is the next one. So uh, same thing happens in me medicine. When you talk about fibrillation, it could be muscle fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation, but the context needs to be clear in order to be for you to, for you to understand. So ontologies are terms with relationships. If we go back to our sports example, we can have an ontology of sports, where we can have ball sports, as opposed to puck sports, for example, football-related sports, or you know, football-descendant sports, which separate into things like North American football, including American football and Canadian football, association football, and we can actually have soccer as a synonym for that, because some people call it that. And then there are rugby derivatives, which are rugby union, Aussie rules football, Gaelic football. And this actually shows that the, even the one sport is called rugby and the other is called Aussie rules football. Aussie rules football is much closer to rugby than it is to soccer, which is association football. Same thing in, uh, can happen in biology. And there's something called the human phenotype ontology that helps organize this medical knowledge, especially in the genetic disease space. You can go from something very general, like general abnormality, to eye diseases, abnormal eye morphology, down to more specifically coloboma, uh, versus globe abnormality, which is a different type of abnormal eye morphology. And then there are different sections for neurologics, skeletal, and many other areas of the human body, body systems. Uh, it's or, it's, there's over 12,000 terms now. It's linked to OMIM, which is a big database of diseases. Uh, so that you have a list of phenotypes, you can sort of say, well, what diseases does that match? And um, it's really the way rare disease world, genetic disease world, germline disease world, 
goes about describing the features nowadays. It's become the lingua franca of the rare disease field. Uh, it's uh, a much better ontology if you're from the medical informatics space. You may have heard of SNOMED CT. SNOMED CT is very broad. It covers everything in medicine. This covers genetic diseases much better, but doesn't have all the other stuff that you don't need outside of the genetic disease sphere when you're dealing with medicine. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, the area of uh, abnormal behavior, and, it's, uh, and uh, it shows you sort of the depth of the ontology. It's also an area that's great for phenotyping graduate students. So it has um, features like um, apathy, um, inappropriate behavior, including disinhibition, uh, irritability, and my favorites, lack of insight and lack of motivation. Um, so uh, this is, um, you know, this shows you the depth into which the ontology goes. Uh, and um, uh, so it's uh, really great for, uh, for multiple things, including medicine. So we've built a system called Phenotips to allow for deep phenotyping, and I'll show you the system today. And um, it uh, was initially a project led by postdoc uh, Marta Gerda. And it started with sort of our frustration with mining clinical records. So the structured data in a clinical record is often misused and lacks specificity. So ICD codes, which is the most structured data in a clinical record, are made for, anybody know what? Describing patients? Billing. So they're mostly um, <coughs> used for figuring out, telling the insurance company what they should pay them for. And this is not really super, like, you know, obviously what the patient presented with is relevant to what you bill for, but they're not exactly the same thing. You can conduct the same procedure based on two slightly different presentations, but that could be important in the rare disease space. So, they're, um, uh, so they lack specificity. The other problem with billing codes is there is something called up billing and something called down billing. Up billing is when a doctor has a choice of two codes. This code will pay them $1,000 and this code will pay them $500. They'll use the $1,000 code. They are both valid. It's not that they're lying. It's just that they're choosing the one that's more convenient for them. Down billing happens when there are two codes. This one may be 1000 bucks. that one may be 500 but the $1,000 one, the doctor knows that the patient's insurance won't pay for. More happens to the south of the border. And uh, then they will choose the $500 one so that the patient's insurance will cover it for the patient. This more happens in academic hospitals where potentially the doctor's salary is not directly tied to their yearly billings. Right. So the really uh, valuable data in the EHR is unstructured. It's free text notes that the doctor takes, but mining it is very messy. So a recent study had 73% accuracy determining whether a patient had dementia from their clinical record based on like a human, compared to a human review. So, and this is because things like dementia are very hard to describe, can be described clinically in many different ways. Like a phrase, you know, oh, at this point, the patient only recognizes close, close relatives. That indicates potentially dementia, given the context, but it doesn't actually have the word dementia in it, and it's hard to um, understand. So, uh, Using ontologies like HPO patient side, so we'd like them to just say dementia, is difficult. There are 11,000 terms in HPO, so going through and checking each one off is going to take time. Uh, going back and remapping data to an ontology post-visit post is time-consuming and prone to error. And so you really want to do it at the time of the patient visit. So the goals of our work was to make the deep phenotyping simple and make it faster than paper. So I'm going to actually give you a little bit of demo phenotypes, and you'll play more with phenotypes in, um, your, uh, in, in the lab. But um, um, so um, oh, the, part, the, the slider is backwards. OK, so you, know, you have the information to enter the name, date of birth. And then you have, for example, can draw the pedigree, because that's really important for genetic studies. So you can go into the system and create a new family and say, well, here's the patient. I didn't give a gender. OK, you know what? Make him male. Those are the two parents. And let's say the parents had their own parents. Boom. You click on that. It creates grandparents. You click on this. This creates more grandparents. 
And let's say the patient had a sibling. Well, so see this line right here? That looks like it goes to a sibling. If you click on that, and say, okay, you know, brother, sister, unknown, and so on. You click and say, okay, we have a sister. Uh, potentially, you know, the father may have uh, remarried and has a second uh, partner. So this goes to a partner. You create a partner right here. And you can actually create a third partner, fourth partner. And the other thing that happens very commonly in the genetic diseases is that there's consanguinity that causes the disease. That's one of the, the mutations cause the disease, but consanguinity is how you get two mutations. So you can actually take somebody and say, oh, well, you know, this sister, this, this sibling link, I can actually drag it to another individual and say, well, these two are actually sisters. Just a quick question. So all this is online web-based? Yep. It's online, web-based, you'll play with it in the lab, and it's actually open source software you can download and install on your own computer if you want. So it creates uh, this, and this line becomes a double line. For those of you who've uh, actually drawn pedigrees in a clinical setting, double line indicates consanguinity. The program inferred it, it's trivial inference, but it, it's inferred and you can add it. Similarly, you can do things like you can say that, uh, oh, well, this, um, this individual, you can add Phenotypes like cancers, clinical phenotypes, personal information, dates of birth, dates of death. If you claim, say somebody has a date of death that's you know, a couple of years ago, they get crossed out the way pedigree is supposed to work. So basically it's meant to do pedigrees the way a genetic counselor or a clinical geneticist would do a pedigree in a clinic. And the reason we built this into the system is that this is like giving the user a carrot to use it, to, to do, use the other parts of the system, which is to really describe the patient well. So then if you go on, there, there are many other sections in phenotypes. I'll just show you a couple. There's a measurement section. This is a one-year, three-month-old baby. And if they say they weigh at this point 15 kilos, right away it'll say, oh, well, that's 100th percentile. That's three standard deviations above the, uh, the mean. And right away you get a growth chart, which shows you where the baby is relative to normal development charts. Um, and then there is a clinical symptoms and physical findings section. And you can see we've already selected increased body weight that was inferred from the data that was entered. But here you can easily type and for other search for other phenotypes. So you can type, uh, I don't know, seizures. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't type, but that's okay. Because if, even though I can't type, it finds the right uh, phenotype. And uh, if you actually type in MR, it'll say, oh, do you really mean intellectual disability? Why does it know that? Well, if you click on this I button, it turns out that intellectual disability has lots of synonyms, such as dull intelligence, uh, intellectual disability, low intelligence, mental deficiency, mental retardation, mental retardation non-specific, mental retardation non-progressive, intellectual disability, and so on. So it actually is able to term, take MR and say, oh, that's an abbreviation of mental retardation. That's one of the things that that could mean. Uh, so you can select these features. And given the ones you've selected, it actually gives you a few others to check that may be important for resolving a differential diagnosis and gives you an, an actual differential from OMIM. Given these three features, here are the matching diseases that we know. So it, basically, it's meant to work in the clinician's workflow, help them collect the data, and then analyze the data all in one place. So trying to connect various features. And there are ways of actually integrating the genome part into this to see which variants are more likely to cause a disease. Okay, so very quick overview. You have more than, you have enough time to play with it yourself, but being cognizant of the time, I'm going to run in, unless somebody has a quick question, yeah. What specifically Sorry? Uh, some part So where's the data coming from? So it really depends on the hospital. Some hospitals, different hospitals have different uh, ways of approaching this. In some hospitals, they get a lot of the data from the patient pre-visit. There's also in a genetics clinic, people generally don't just walk into a genetics clinic off the street. They're often referred to it from uh, a more general <coughs> clinic or another specialist. So there is information that's coming from that other clinic, so a referral letter of some kind. 
Uh, some genetics clinics are very good about getting the patient to fill out part of the pedigree, like give me information about your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles online before you actually show up. And then that could be integrated into the pedigree before the patient ever walks into the door. But then a lot of the data gets collected during the actual visit. So genetics clinics are very different from your GP or mostly any other doctor that you are likely to go to in that a patient visit typically lasts one to two hours. So a lot of time to collect a lot of information and a lot of time for the doctor to look through and do some extensive phenotyping. Question? Yeah. Is this something that the patient could Great question. Uh, definitely, it can be. There are ways that this can be used to fill in gaps. Um, there are certain things that you really don't want patients to self-report or to try to, to understand if they, they do, because it's you know, it's uh, it's quite tricky to you know. For example, one of the features of genetic disease is a flat filtrum. So like having no bumps right here. Um, and you know, most humans are not going to be able to figure out if their filtrum is flat or not. Exactly. <laughs> so, it's, so there are certain things that you don't want for people to self-report. But often we do know cases of you know, patients going out above and beyond and learning a lot about their disease and actually get, becoming more of an expert on it than their doctor. So in that case, certainly, we are, we are thinking of ways of doing it. I can be glad to discuss them with you during a break or during uh, one of the times that we have uh, uh, in the course. But yes, that's a great question. Getting the patient involved is um, very important. So some of the anthologies of using a system like phenotypes, you can integrate data between different studies. All the data under the hood is mapped to the HPO. There's a little bit of free text if there's, we, you really didn't find anything in the HPO, but if any, at all, anything at all is similar <coughs> in the HPO, you're presented with that option and it helps you to collect data that's structured. You're, as a result, able to connect um, uh, data collected from one study and data connected in another study because the terminology is the same. You don't have to worry whether seizures and epilepsy are the same thing or aren't the same thing. They really are. But. You can do better and more thorough analysis of the genome data, as you will sort of play with during the lab. And our hope was to get clinicians to use phenotypes in the exam room. We had variable success. Some do, some don't. And the other important part that something like phenotypes gives you is it helps train the next generation of clinicians. You can, di you can get diagnosis assistance. You can identify previously seen patients who are similar to your patient. And this is a feature I didn't show you, but you can search the database of patients that has been built up over time. And you can do decisions based on prior outcomes as a result. I'll just skip that. So then how do we go on, now that we have phenotyped the patients, to identify the candidate variants in, a, um, in an exome or a genome? There is a lot of candidate variants in any patients' exome or genome. So uh, this is a list of variants identified from, candidate variants identified from a patient in a Canadian Care for Rare project cohort. Uh, so a patient who was seen because of a rare genetic disease and sequenced on a research basis. And so a whole bunch of variants. And really looking at a table like that and trying to figure out which one of them may or may not have caused the disease is not so simple. And a lot of what you'll hear today and other modules will be about filtering this data and trying to understand which are more likely to contribute or less likely to contribute. And what people do is they do this sort of pipeline where they first filter by population frequency. Anything that's common goes out the window. And what we mean by common has been becoming more and more rare over time as we sort of have a better idea of what the actual population looks like. So it used to be minor allele frequency less than you know, half a percent. I know some people use now one in a thousand. Uh, it uh, started off being around one percent. Then you say, at that point, you do variant classification and prioritization. You take the non-synonymous variants, the ones that actually change the protein in some way, and uh, try to filter by uh, some, put some kind of priority score, either using software that look at the variant and try to predict what its function is, or by using ex other external information. 
So for non-synonymous variants, you can look at things like, would this variant likely change the protein structure by doing some modeling of the structure? What would the structure look like if you change that uh, amino acid? Uh, looking at amino acid chemistry, is this, you know, changing the amino acid from say, hydrophobic to hydrophilic, which would probably change the structure quite a bit. Uh, and the most powerful tool is looking at homology, looking at other really similar proteins and say, have we actually seen that in other similar proteins? Because if we have, or if that site is generally variable in lots of these proteins, probably that means it's okay to change it. Probably it's not going to do too much to the protein. So that's the functional information. But the other thing you want to do is actually look at the variant in the context of the family structure and say, well, I have a variant. Is that present and also in the previous gen other affected individuals? Because if it is, that sort of increases my probability of this. And if I have a huge pedigree, I can get become very, very confident that that is actually the variant that causes the disease. Unfortunately, if this is what your pedigree looks like, uh, you have two individuals. Well, what's the probability that the affected father has the same variant? Well, 50%. So that really doesn't give you much. So what do you need? You actually need other families. You need other families where you can find the same variant or at least variants in the same gene, the same phenotype, and identify whether the match is uh, real or not. But finding these new families is going to be difficult. Why? Well, because rare diseases are rare. There's not that many of them. If there are 10 people in the whole world who have this disease, the odds that both of them walk into your office, if you're a geneticist, are pretty low. Um, so people use all sorts of genome interpretation tools to help with the task like this. So they use patient symptoms together with gene function information. So if a gene is known to cause a specific changes in a specific pathway and changes in that pathway are known to yield specific clinical phenotypes, then maybe if you change your gene, then it also will lead to the same clinical phenotype. There are also people, people use mouse models. So what they do is they take the mouse and knock out that gene, make a mouse knockout, look and then phenotype the mouse. See what's wrong with the mouse. Maybe it has a you know, abnormally shaped spout. And that could map to facial dysmorphism in a human. Or they have, uh, you know, some brain abnormality, some seizures, seizure disorders. Then, well, that could map to an epilepsy in a human. So there's actually huge high throughput mouse knockout studies happening to knock out pretty much every single, you know, all kinds of, all, the, all of the genes to see what is the phenotype that results. Uh, and the... This is mapped to something called the mouse phenotype ontology, which then is linked to a human phenotype ontology. And you know that an abnormally shaped spout could map to things like facial dysmorphism. So that's, you know, the last thing I'm going to talk to you is about matchmaking. How do we actually find other individuals in the, um, out there in the world who have a disease if you have a, now a mutation in a new disease? Well, rare diseases are altogether rare, but each, each one is rare, but altogether they're actually pretty common. So I don't believe the 6% number. It's that what you get if you add the prevalence of all rare diseases in the database called Orphanet together. I don't, you know, we don't have 6% of the population affected by a rare disease, but numbers around 2 or 3% are actually quite believable because many of the rare diseases don't have extremely visible uh, features and uh, so you may not even patients don't sometimes don't know even th that they have it if it's really mild or it just doesn't show show up until you sort of you look very closely and um, when you're a doctor and you see this ultra rare genetic disease you have trouble you may not recognize it even if it's known just because you haven't, don't have experience with it or you may not have an insufficient sample size to understand that this is a novel gene. Let's say this is the first time you've seen mutations in the gene, and it's sort of, it uh, usually happens like clinician looks at the mutation and says, or researcher actually in this case, um, well, the gene is in this well-described pathway, and other mutations in this pathway lead to muscle diseases. 
this patient has a de novo mutation in this pathway, which means that the patient's parents don't have that mutation, it's just the patient who has it. The phenotype matches quite well, but that specific gene has never been described in the literature as contributing to a human disease. What do you do? So in the old days, what you would do is you would go to a conference and present your case and say, look at what interesting thing I've found. Anybody seen things like this? And uh, geneticists are amazing at sort of remembering, like, yeah, oh, yeah, I saw that, you know, X years ago. Or, you know, what really amazed me is this morphologist, people who actually look at the facial structure. You show them a picture of a patient, and they'll be like, I saw five years ago a patient with that same facial structure. And, you know, go in their record, pull out a photograph and show. And how that brain works, I don't understand, but uh, they're amazing at this. That's the sort of the way that things have done, or you publish a case report around your patient. Now, what we wanted to do is take matchmaking into the 21st century and take all of these rare cases that all doctors are seeing all around the world and bring them together so that people can actually share information effectively. And this effort has been part of a broader effort called the Matchmaker Exchange, where Different groups have built these matchmaking tools, and now we've gotten all of them to also talk together. So in general, how does matching a match work? You put data into one matchmaker, and another doctor puts their data into a different one. Then the databases talk to each other and figure out, hey, we actually have something in common, <coughs> and let both of the users know. And then the users actually now talk to each other and say, is that really interesting or no? Is that are the database systems completely wrong and this is not an interesting thing for us to follow up on? And um, so, uh, oh, this, I did update the slide. This is from a year ago, but um, um, this um, uh, this is the two various uh, efforts that have contributed to the matchmaker exchange. And specifically, we've built one tool called Phenome Central, which has a lot of data from the Canadian rare disease cohorts and something called the Undiagnosed Disease Networks International, which is a lot of data from US and Europe for um, undiagnosed, to try to diagnose undiagnosed patients. So Phenome Central, again, which you'll play with, it's a matchmaker, which allows uh, different uh, users to connect with each other. Uh, so the way it works is you submit a patient, and to do this, you use the phenotypes interface that you've, I've already showed, uh, but you can also, oh, this looks ugly, uh, but um, you can also import data from uh, other phenotypes instances directly in, or you can, and then you can add a VCF file, which you will also get to do in your uh, project. And then Phenome Central goes into its database and searches for other similar patients. And the way it does it, it uses the human phenotype ontology. So if you think of this tree structure as the ontology, and you have these features that are annotated for one patient and these features that are annotated for another patient, we compute what's similar by going up the tree and then looking for the overlap between those trees, really identifying what's common between these. So, you know, this could be uh, one kind of eye abnormality. This could be a different kind of eye abnormality, but both of them have an eye abnormality while this patient has this thing which maps under two different systems, uh, and then it, you can compute the similarity. And there's a little bit of math that happens. We look at, for each feature, how likely it is to just occur by chance. So really rare features get a higher score than very common features. And um, we compute the information content, basically how much information do you get from the fact that both of these patients have these phenotypes. And then it also incorporates gene data, it uh, incorporates variants, and tries to score the variants based on the phenotype present in both patients to see, uh, using a tool called Examizer, to see if things are shared. So uh, in this case, they would say, well, oh, the red gene is actually pretty high scoring for both of these patients, so maybe that's likely a cause of the disease. And looks at actually lots of other patients as well to see what's common to what's common to just a couple, but not too many. Once you do that, you can actually see the patients that are similar to your patient to identify the highest matching similar patients. And for that patient, you get to see your phenotypes for the patient, the other patient's phenotypes, and which variants are in both. So 
actually in this older version you didn't see it directly but uh, after you contacted the other user you would actually get the full information revealed to you and you could see that uh, this mutation actually causes uh, the disease in uh, both patients. So uh, this is what sort of the end result of Phenome Central will be. Here are the R2 patients. Here's what's similar about them. Is that interesting enough to go and write a paper? And there are things like terms of use about who can access this data and things like that. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Questions before we, we have the lab product practical right next. So questions before we sort of go into that? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So ma <coughs> Matchmaker Exchange was really built around this use case of we want to find new disease genes which have never been described before and write papers about them. What about the disease genes where we now, now we've identified the disease, and we know it's a new disease, we've published the paper, but we have two patients. Well, you know, patients 3 through 10 will give us a lot of information about the course of the disease, how it changes the variability of the presentation. What do we do with that data? So in Phenome Central, you can actually set the flag on your patients to say, I'm no longer interested in being informed about new matches because I already know that this is the cause of the disease. But if others are looking for that case, here is the paper that we published on it. And they can contact you then to say, oh, we have now a cohort of 10. Let's look at uh, a broader cord. And some of the studies in the matchmaker change have looked at, you know, like say, oh, we now have 15 patients with this disease. What do we know now that we didn't know when we had three? So, um, but there is no structured way of doing it. And there's really no, at this point, there's nothing like matchmaker exchange in the clinical context rather than the research context. So what do you do as a frontline clinician who is just, I'm going in, I'm, this is my patient. I don't care about writing a paper. I just need to know what to do about my patient, how to treat it. It's an ultra-rare disease on which the only thing that's published is a study of two, with two patients. This is something people are talking about. So we, some people call it, we call it clinical MME, uh, cl clinical matchmaker exchange. It's really no longer a matchmaker exchange. Now it's sort of an information gathering tool. But um, I think it would be, a, this is something that uh, people are thinking about but haven't really gotten.